Of all of the IPs I've covered on this channel, few games have had my attention as completely during my time researching them as Pal World, an open-world creature-collecting game that riffs upon the likes of Pokémon while building on the gameplay formula of Ark Survival Evolved, Pal World seems to have no shortage of things to discover, from locations to creatures to hidden mechanics and even a fair bit of lore. There is a ton to do in this game, and even though I've already made an entire video going over the lore of Pal World at length, I find that there's still more that I want to discuss, especially since it seems that a lot of you really enjoyed the first video that I put out about the game, with several comments asking me to cover more. Now, the thing is, I've been diligently researching for another upcoming video on this game, the one that I hinted at in the previous upload, in fact, but part of that research has led me to comb through lots of additional information, and since that's going to take a while to sift through, I didn't want to leave you guys hanging in the meantime. Uh, if only there was some way to make a video out of the research process I was doing in the meantime, Hmm, what to make. I'll have to seek counsel with someone I trust. So yeah, I don't know, I'm just at a loss, man. I mean, I already kind of talked about all the lore in the game, and what am I going to do to hold people over until the next one's out? Uh, I don't know. What if you just read the PAL deck? Yeah, okay. A massive database of PAL-related information, the PAL deck is an encyclopedia of knowledge that functions almost identically to the Pokedex from the world of Pokémon. And today, I'll be reading through the whole thing, simply because, well, I want to, damn it. And there's a whole lot of lore in here that we haven't even discussed yet. My hope here is that not only will this be a bit of fun, but also help to inform some of the future conversations we'll be having on this channel surrounding the game. All in all, I also think an upload like this is best to make sure that everyone's on the same playing field in terms of of knowledge as we continue to try and uncover Pal World lore together in the future. And with that, I hope you'll join me today as we delve into the mysteries and secrets hidden within the Pal Deck. Now before we begin reading, I feel the need to explain how we're going to be parsing out all of this information. First of all, with a total of 137 unique PAL deck entries, some are bound to be a bit more interesting than others, and demand a higher level of focus. In other words, though I'm going to be reading out each entry the game has to offer, I'm not going to be commenting on each and every one of them individually. This is not only so as not to bore you to death with some obligatory, contrived statement after every single PAL, but also because a lot of the entries are fairly open and shut. Because of that, I'm going to not dwell on these all too much unless there's a good reason to do so, and if I just keep rolling after an entry is done, well, it's just simply because I don't have much meaningful input to make about the pal in question. That being said, if there's something that interests you about a pal, whether I spoke on it or not, please feel free to let me know below. I'm always eager to hear people's thoughts on stuff like this, especially if there's some subtext that I may have missed out on. Finally, and this is a big part of why I wanted to cover each and every entry today, I want you to focus on how pal deck entries evolve as this list goes on. Many pieces here, especially in the earlier half of the PAL deck, read as parodies of the type of descriptions often seen in the Pokedex, often incorporating self-aware, violent, or off-putting undertones to highlight and jab at the creature-collecting genre as a whole. It's pretty funny stuff, and we'll be seeing a lot of it as we delve into this today. With that, though, let's finally start our descent into the depths of the PAL deck, starting with what are, canonically, the three weakest PALs in the entire game. Number 1. Lamball. A walk up a hill tends to end with this pal tumbling back down. This causes it to become dizzy and unable to move, making it easy to capture and kill. As a result, this pal has tumbled down to the very bottom of the food chain itself. Number 2. Cativa. At a glance, it appears full of confidence, but it is in fact weak and cowardly. Being toyed with by a Cativa is in many ways the greatest of disgraces. And number three, Chicopee. Extremely weak and far too delicious. It is one of the weakest pals alongside Lamball. No matter how many are hunted, they just keep appearing. Nothing groundbreaking here to start off, but it is kind of interesting how the game holds no punches right off the bat. Already, we have multiple mentions of pal death and hunting, which, bear in mind, are in entries which correspond to pals that are likely some of the first that you're going to be finding in the entire game. These kinds of themes are going to become standard as we continue, and in fact, the entries that directly proceed this point will continue to entrench those ideas in the minds of many players, even within the early game. Number 4. Lifmonk. Intelligent as a 5-7 to seven year old human child, it makes a wonderful partner, but there have been more than a few cases where they've killed their master after learning to use weapons. Number 5. Fox 
Black Sparks. It is unskilled at controlling fire from the moment it is born, and tends to choke on the flames it breathes unintentionally. Fox Sparks sneezes are one of the leading causes of forest fires. Number 6. Fwack Using its own body water, this pal can create waves anywhere. It body surfs when in a hurry, but the resulting speed often ends in a fatal collision. Number 7. Spark It During the dry season, this pal is always on the verge of blowing a fuse. Sparks can fly with even the slightest provocation even amongst allies. Number 8. Tansy Long ago, this pal used long objects like tree branches as weapons. After coming into contact with humans, however, it found something slightly more effective. Guns by now you probably get the idea of what kinds of things we're going to be seeing a lot of, so how about a few entries that are a bit more wholesome? Number 9. Ruby Wild Ruby surprisingly never gets sick. Eating one piece of charcoal a day, made by burning a branch, is the secret to its eternal health. Number 10. Pangolet The feathers of this pal have all but disappeared, but sadly its desire to fly has remained as strong as ever. Even now, it tries to fly again in any way it can. Number 11. Pen King Surprisingly, it is unrelated to Pangolet. Ever wanting to be the center of attention, this pal will strut its stuff for any onlookers. And now, just like that, we're onto another pal that can be used as a weapon. Number 12. Jolt Hog Releases the electricity stored in its body when under attack, producing a shock that can be over 10 million volts. If thrown, it can even be more lethal than any conventional heavy weaponry. Here we also reach the first pal on our list to demonstrate a subspecies, or in other words, an alternate version of the creature with a different base type and slightly differing description. Number 12b, Jolt Hog Christ. It releases the cold air stored in its body when under attack. The frigid blast it radiates is cold enough to freeze the surrounding air and easily pierces through any attacker's body. Number 13, Gummoss, a strange pal with a body resembling tree sap. It gradually loses strength if it has nothing to cover its body with, eventually rotting away. This isn't directly related to the description of the pal deck entry, but there is actually a secret variation of this pal that doesn't show up in the official records, and that's this flowering gummoss, which has a very low chance of spawning out in the wild. If you see one of these, be sure to grab it, you may not ever see one again, and uh, I guess that's your rare pal PSA for today. Hopefully in a future update they make a section for it in the pal deck or something, even a little toggle so that we can switch to see what it looks like, I don't know. Number 14, Vixie. The idol of Palpagos Island. If you bully a Vixie, you best be prepared to become enemies with the whole world. Number 15, Hucrates. Often lost in thought, it sometimes finds it difficult to sleep. I think, therefore I am. Yeah, me too, buddy. Number 16, Tiefent. Large amounts of water pour from what is thought to be its nose, though some say that it is, in fact, just snot. This has sparked a fierce debate among PAL scholars. Number 17, Depresso. It has few friends because of the perpetually grouchy look on its face, but it is in fact kind-hearted. Some have seen it feeding Vixie, who have strayed from their pack. This one's interesting to me because despite its apparent kindness, Depresso is extremely quick to attack low-level players. That being said, it seems to me that it's more partial to pals than people, judging by the Vixie line anyway, so I guess that kind of makes sense. Number 18, Kremis. Compared to Lambal, it has finer wool and a temperament more suited for domestication. However, it has historically always been kept as a pet. Cuteness is considered a virtue. Number 19, Daydream. It puts those it is interested in to sleep and shows them an endless stream of happy dreams. Those who fall under its spell are never to wake until death takes them. Number 20, Rush Roar. Being an extremely aggressive pal, it often picks fights before gauging its opponent's strength. Though small, its powerful charge can even send boulders flying. Number 21, Nox. If you find Nox hair in your bedding, you should leave it where it lays and leave immediately. Picking it up is a one-way ticket to a never-ending night. What this never-ending night entails is wholly unclear. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the abilities spoken of in this entry are similar to Daydream's Endless Sleep, but it's tough to say. Let me know if you interpreted this any differently, though. Number 22, Fuddler. Its large claws boast of diamond-like hardness. However, sharpening these claws consumes most of its energy, leading it to sometimes spending entire days doing nothing else. Number 23, Kilimari. It wraps itself around an enemy's head, sucking out their insides. Pal mummies are 
occasionally found, but these are, in fact, Kilimari victims. Number 24, Mao. Its hard tail does not deteriorate even when cut off. Some believed these severed tails to be good luck, but for the innumerable Mao who were poached as a result, they were anything but. That's kind of dark, but it's ironically contrasted with the description of the Mao subspecies known as Number 24B, Mao Christ. Its crystalline tail is beautiful, but shatters when this pal dies. Some believe it is good luck to raise one, so Mao Christ in captivity are treated with great care. Number 25, Celeray. Riding the wind, this pal travels where it pleases. Should it find a partner along the way, the encounter will mark its journey's end. Number 26, Dire Howl. Long ago, Dire Howl would hunt alongside humans, but over the years, this bond faded. A very short description, but an interesting one nevertheless, simply because it's essentially the opposite of how canine domestication is thought to have happened in our own world. Kind of funny stuff, and it lends a good in-universe reason as to why the Dire Howl are are some of the most aggressive pals in the entire game. Right up there, in fact, with the next entry. Number 27, Toko Toko. A frightening pal that produces exploding eggs. It often fires these eggs from its rear end as a form of defense, but when spent, the pal itself explodes. Number 28, Floppy. It prefers places that have an abundance of vegetation, but hay fever has apparently become a problem for Floppy as of late. The part that sticks out to me here is the use of the term of late at the end, which seems to insinuate that pollen is on the rise due to changes in Palpagos's environment, and since the same effect is already taking place in our own world due to climate change, then I think that means it's safe to say global warming is canon in Pal World. And this is the type of deep-cutting lore that I was hoping to see. Number 29, Mazarina. Milk pours from this pal like water from an open faucet, regardless of its gender. It's truly a mystery of life, although this mystery may be better left unsolved. Yes, it is absolutely better left unsolved. I do not want to know what is going on with the male Mazarina in particular. We're gonna move on. Number 30, Bristla. This prickly pal's thorns are highly poisonous. It is friendly with Cinnamoth and only smiles while a Cinnamoth is drinking its nectar. Number 31, Gobfin. Long ago, it was a large and powerful aquatic pal. As food became scarce, it evolved to live on land. Since walking requires much energy, it gradually became smaller and is now a small and puny pal. 31B, Gobfin Ignis. Once upon a time, it was a giant and powerful aquatic pal. However, with the dwindling availability of food, it ventured onto land. As a consequence of burning away calories to walk, it astonishingly awakened its power to control fire. Another thing we're going to be seeing a lot of throughout this video is stuff like this, where a pal subspecies has a similar origin to their original counterparts, but with some kind of funny twist. And as a matter of fact, we're about to see a couple more of these instances in rapid succession, with pals 32 and 33 respectively. Number 32, Hang You. Its gigantic arms can rip apart even iron. As a particularly cruel form of execution, serious criminals would be strung up in a public square, and a Hang You would tear the skin right from their bones. Alright, maybe funny wasn't the right word but uh, you'll see where I'm going with this, I swear. Number 32B, Hang You Christ. Its gigantic arms can tear through blocks of ice. There were times when great sinners were tried in the town square and had their hair torn out by Hang You Christ as a brutal form of public humiliation. Number 33, Mossanda. A pal so powerful it's hard to believe. In one experiment, this pal tore through 3,000 sheets of paper at once. It's only by some miracle that this pal isn't a meat eater. Number 33B, Mossanda Lux. A pal whose power is truly shocking. By alternating electrical currents in its body, this pal's been able to overload its own strength. When it comes to sheer power, this pal may be top of the list. Number 34, Wooly Pop. Its entire body is 18,000 times sweeter than sugar. Sugar. Carnivorous pals lured by its scent will find themselves overwhelmed by sweetness and even pass out should they take a bite of this pal. Number 35, Caprity. The shrub on this pal's back produces berries as long as it is properly fed. It offers these berries to potential mates, and if the flavor is to their liking, romance blossoms. Number 36, Melpaca. Don't be fooled by this pal's fluffy appearance. A hypersonic kick from one of these long legs may send you flying to the other side of the world. The only concern I have with this entry is that I can't tell if I'm supposed to take it literally or not. Number 37, Ekthyrdir. The one who possesses the most impressive antlers becomes the leader of the herd. If their antlers are broken, they become depressed and leave the herd never to be seen again. Number 37B, Ekthyrdir Terra. The individual with the hardest horns becomes the leader. Once the horns are lost, so too is its leadership status. It leaves the herd amidst farewell glances and quietly returns to the earth. 
Geez, man, at least the vanilla Ecthyrdir entry leaves it to audience discretion to decide whether they think they're gonna die or not, but there's really only so many ways we can be expected to interpret Returns to the Earth. Number 38. Nightwing. It carries newborn pals to its nest and raises them as a surrogate parent. Once the baby pal has fattened up, it hunts them. I'm honestly not even surprised at this point, and we're not even a third of the way through. Number 39. Ribunny. A pal who's never without a bright smile. Occasionally, it gets its tentacles tied up in knots by Kativa's pranks. During those moments, its expression changes into something altogether demonic. I know I'm supposed to wonder at the so-called demonic expression, but what I'm really hung up by on this one is the fact that these are considered tentacles. Number 40, Incineram. In the dark of night, this pal snatches prey to bring back to its territory. What happens to those poor souls afterwards isn't too hard to imagine. Number 40B, Incineram Knocked. It specifically targets baby pals, taking them back to its territory. One can only imagine the profound despair of the parent pal whose child has been taken away. All right, makes sense. Number 41, Cinemoth. Sniffing its scales produces a feeling of unparalleled euphoria. There was some effort to further regulate this byproduct, but the Free Pal Alliance have vehemently opposed these measures, putting a stop to them. I'm gonna imagine that the euphoric sensation is also probably what caused the pal Brisla to smile in their aforementioned entry, but that's just a guess. Number 42, Arsox. In ancient times, carnivorous pals pursued them relentlessly. The absurd fury in the cries of Arsox trans transformed into a raging inferno, which has been passed on to this day. I'm kind of surprised that there's no subspecies of this pal, since their origin story makes it very clear that at some point in time, these guys would have lacked the characteristic fire. I, for one, would at least be passively interested to know how they appeared in the past, but I don't know. I'm not banking on this one to be added to the game or anything, so I guess it's probably going to be left a mystery. Number 43, Doomud. When too relaxed, its reaction time drastically declines. Even if it were sliced from head to tail, it probably wouldn't even realize that it should be dead until the next morning. Hard to deny that there's some parallels to Slowpoke here. I think that one's fairly obvious. Number 44, Cognito. Long ago, it freely soared the skies. After losing a contest with Galeclaw, it abandoned the skies, and now lives a secretive life in the dark of night. I love the idea that something as simple as losing a contest can result in a drastic turn in the evolutionary projection of an entire species. So far, this one seems the most folklorish, and it gets me kind of excited, because there's some other entries like this further in, too. Number 45, Lee's Punk. A pal that always takes care to maintain a stylish stance, always on the hunt for the coolest poses, if Given a mirror, it will spend all day posing in front of it. Number 45B, Lee's Punk Ignis, a pal that has an unusual obsession with their standing posture. Always in search of the hottest pose, this pal's owner is constantly presented with fervent stances. Number 46, Loop Moon. The horns on its head grow under the moonlight. It doesn't hate the sun, but its horns itch when sunlight hits them. Number 47, Gale Claw. A pal that can easily take flight even while grasping a human. It is, however, prone to letting go when tired, which has led to the sudden demise of more than a few souls. Number 48, Robin Quill. A pal that is very similar to humans who hunt and live in the forests. It may prove to be a key for understanding what pals are and how they diverged from humans so long ago. All right, hold on just a minute. I'm assuming that this is meant to be taken in the broader scope of evolution, like how all life probably stemmed from a species of protist at some point in the past, but the way it's written sort of makes it seem like pals are just a family of creatures that just split off from humans well after our species was already established, which is just such a weird and baffling concept, it kind of just comes out of nowhere. That being said, some of these entries do kind of lend themselves to theory crafting, and indeed, the idea that pals have diverged from human evolution at some point in time is a very commonly discussed theory within the PAL world community, and this entry is pretty much where it stems from. I'm really not sure what to make of it, I'm kind of leaning on the original evolutionary interpretation that I mentioned a minute ago, but I really don't know, I could kind of be swayed either way. What do you think? Let me know. 48B, Robin Quill Terra. A pal that lives a hunting life in rocky areas and is very close to humans. When Robin Quill Terra bones are found in ruins, there are always human bones found nearby as well. 
Yeah, this doesn't help answer my question, like, at all. Uh, if anything, I'm more confused. Am I gonna have to make a whole other video about this? Number 49, Gory Rat. It beats the ground rhythmically to communicate with its comrades. The meaning of each rhythm differs by troop, but the distinction between them is still largely unknown. Number 50, Bee Guard. A servant that pledges loyalty to Elizabeth. Any that cause harm to the queen are immediately expelled from the hive. It will gladly give its life to protect its queen. Number 51, Elizabeth. A chosen queen to rule over Bee Guard. There is a never-ending stream of servants willing to work themselves to death for the pleasure of serving their queen. Number 52, Grintail. Grintail's eyes light up the moment anyone enters its territory. This is no figure of speech. Its eyes literally light up. Just thought I'd let you know, this is my favorite pal in the entire game. Let's move on. Number 53, Swee. Crawling along the ground, it eats microscopic organic matter. After a while, it discharges any substances that provide no nutrition. By using it as a mop for cleaning, everyone wins. Number 54, Sweepa. While hibernating, a large number of Sui hide within its voluminous body hair. The most ever recorded is 101. Sui and Sweepa, congratulations with the two very wholesome entries for my second and third favorite pals in the game respectively. Number 55, Chill It. It can curl up its body and roll around at extremely high speeds. Long ago, people would tie bags of milk to domesticated chillet as they grazed to produce butter using the spinning force. 56. Univolt. It used to be considered an emissary of the Thunder God, and thus was not hunted by people. However, after witnesses observed one die from a lightning strike, its reverence faded, and it quite literally fell into the role of a workhorse. Number 57. Foxicle. On nights when the aurora is visible, it looks up toward the sky and begins to howl a beautiful song. This does, however, leave it vulnerable to attacks from enemies. Number 58. Pyron. Its entire body has evolved into a highly efficient radiator, gifting it with astounding stamina. When someone has mounted it, this pal takes caution not to burn them. Number 58b, Pyron Noct. It burns mysterious dark matter as energy, and expels the remaining particles from its body. If someone rides it, they should take care so as not to gallop down the path of darkness. The most interesting thing here to me is that the technology on this remote island is insinuated to have somehow developed to a level sufficient enough to reliably detect and identify dark matter in order to make a statement like this even make sense. It's just funny to me that this was somehow figured out on the Palpagos Islands of all places, despite dark matter still presumably baffling the rest of the world. Number 59, Raindrix. Its transparent cerulean antlers glow with the cold of absolute zero. Any who touch them with their bare hands are instantly instantly frozen over and smashed to pieces. Alright, the dark matter thing is starting to make more sense now that we know we have access to a substance which consistently sits at absolute zero. Uh, I guess that would make some sort of scientific exploration into this a little bit easier. So, okay, I guess I'm convinced. Number 60, Rayhound. At full speed, it could be mistaken for a bolt of lightning. If two Rayhounds collide, the sound is like that of a powerful thunderclap. That's a crazy image to imagine, first of all, but also props on the name with this one. Naming your lightning-themed dog after a species which the American Kennel Club calls, quote, the champion sprinter of dogdom is a fantastic reference. Well done. Number 61, Kitsune. Despite its appearance, Kitsune is extremely sensitive and will flee into a cave when spooked. Long ago, it was considered an ill omen if one were found nearby. Number 62, Dazai. Often kind to lonely pals. However, the moment a pal mistakes this for actual companionship, it seizes the opportunity to blast them with a thunderbolt. I think we all know someone like that. Uh, very cool. Number 63, Lunaris. It can control those who carelessly stare into its eyes. Those seen with a Lunaris are, in its mind, simply under its control. Number 64, Dinosum. A pal who once angered cannot be pacified. It rages on and on like an inferno. The phrase, step on a Dinosum's tail, has come to mean enraging someone. Number 64b, Dinosum Lux. Though struck by lightning, it lives on. The phrase, struck by a Dinosum Lux's bolt, has come to mean narrowly escaping death. Number 65, Serpent. Its hydrodynamic form is well suited to life in water. Poachers often catch them and use them in place of surfboards. Number 65b, Serpent Terra. Its aerodynamic form is well suited to life on the sand. Poachers often catch them and use them in place of surfboards. Number 66, Marwraith. It relishes the peculiar scent living things give off when they are near death. If a Marwraith has taken a liking to you, it's safe to assume that's why. 
Considering these things appear at night near the Astral Mountains, which gets extremely cold and is undoubtedly one of the most inhospitable regions in the game, yeah, I believe it. And great visual design, by the way. Number 67, Dig Toys. A walking contradiction, possessing the strongest shell and the only drill capable of piercing it. Dig Toys's fable is a popular children's tale. Number 68, Tombat, often appears out of the blue to flaunt its prized wings in front of other pals. Although this appears to be an intimidation tactic, the pal seems to derive some kind of pleasure from the display. Number 69, Lovander. Seeking a night of love, it is always chasing someone around. At first, it only showed interest in other pals, but in recent years, even humans have become the target of its debauchery. I don't have any justification for the in recent years part of this like I did for Floppy, unless maybe global warming has also tricked the Lovander species into heat of some other kind, but either way, what I am certain of is that this pal occupying Paldex number 69 is not a mistake. Number 70, Flambell. When it starts crying, this pal produces magma in place of tears. The magma that pours out is absorbed back into its body, causing it to get hotter and hotter. The more it cries, the stronger it becomes. That actually just makes no sense, but it's cute, so who cares? Number 71, Van Worm. The melodies of a flute made from the exoskeleton of a van worm are said to cross whole mountain ranges. In the past, such flutes were used to signal an attack. Number 61B, Van Worm Christ. The melodies of a flute made from the the exoskeleton of a Van Worm Christ are said to cross whole mountain ranges. In ages past, such flutes were said to signal victory in battle. Yet another pair of entries that play off each other like how Mao and Mao Christ did? I guess ice-type mutations were just revered in Pal World history or something, I don't know. Number 72, Bushi. Its body becomes a blade upon death, to be taken up by the next generation. If someone other than a Bushi wields the blade, the soul within torments them until they are driven mad. This is just a cool-ass entry. The idea that the swords that they fight with are literally made from their ancestors is a really intriguing concept that I think has a lot of narrative potential. Something like that's just a great twist for a book or an anime or something, I don't know. Maybe it's been done before and that's what this is referencing, but I don't know of it. Either way, cool stuff and great entry. Number 73, Beacon. Some think it is a related species to Ragnahawk, but there is in fact no connection. Using its sharp beak, it descends on its prey in a quick motion that resembles a bolt of lightning. Number 74, Ragnahawk. Some think it is a related species to Beacon, but there is in fact no connection. It mainly eats rocks, and after many long years, its beak and head have hardened to accommodate this diet. I like the entries of these two because it plays off the pairs of Pokemon that should be related but just aren't. Like, uh, I guess like Throw and Sock. Those are the only two ones I can think of right now, but I know there are others too. Also, they resemble the legendary birds. Very cool. Number 75, Catrus. With the power of shadows, it produces arcane phenomena. It prefers to eat food raw and is particularly hostile toward Wixen. Number 76, Wixen. With the power of light, it produces arcane phenomena. It prefers to eat food well done and is particularly hostile toward Catrus. Number 77, Verdash. Land that Verdash has run across becomes extremely fertile, with thick vegetation growing there soon after. It will not run anywhere that herbicide has been used. Well, to be fair, that's probably just like good practice in general, even if you aren't made of plants. Number 78, Veilet. The castle was filled with the king's favorite flowers. A great battle ensued and flames approached the castle. Amidst the chaos, the spirit of a flower appeared. From the fairy tale, The King's Flower. I'd love to see more of this story added to the game. Perhaps we'll get some more lore in a future update. I can't help but feel like this is somehow related to the castle town just north of Mount Obsidian, though. I don't know if the intent was for this story to actually seem as if it had taken place within the world of the game, or whether it's just a folktale. But either way, that just sticks out in my mind for some reason. Number 79, Sibilix. A pal that likes the rain and will often bask in rain showers until the weather clears up. On rainy days, fox barks can be found taking shelter beneath it. That's a very sweet entry, and I love it and everything, but it consequently means that spawn patterns in the game can't be taken entirely at face value, I guess, since fox barks exclusively spawns in these areas, and Sibilix appears here. Nonetheless, though, that's wholesome as hell, and I love it. Number 80, Elphadran. It possesses a demeanor as pure as its appearance suggests. Perhaps because of this, it is sometimes unable to discern good from evil, often allowing wrongdoers to take advantage of it. Number 80B, Elphidran Aqua. 
It possesses a demeanor as pure as its appearance suggests. Perhaps because of this, it harbors no ill will in any of its actions, and is indifferent even after killing someone. Number 81, Kelpsy. Its personality changes depending on the quality of the water it was born into. Kelpsy born into polluted waters are generally ill-tempered and quickly become delinquents. Number 81B, Kelpsy Ignis. Their personalities change depending on the temperature of the water where they were born. Kelpsy born in warm waters generally have a passionate, motivated personality. Number 82, Azurobe. This pal's white ribbon turns black if doused with impure water. Given its usefulness in detecting poison, this pal was once overhunted. This past has left them bitter towards humanity. Number 83. Cryolynx. It can easily climb steep mountains with its hard claws. However, its short legs make it difficult to descend, often leaving it stranded in high places. Number 84, Blaze Howl. While it prefers raw meat, it always ends up eating well done meat. This is due to its blistering claws, which it uses as weapons. It simply doesn't realize its prey gets burned to a crisp. Number 84B, Blaze Howl Knocked. While it prefers raw meat, it always ends up eating tainted meat. This is due to its dark claws, which it uses as weapons. It simply doesn't realize its prey gets cursed. Number 85, Relaxosaurus. Contrary to its blasé appearance, it's quite ferocious. It perceives everything in its sight as prey and will stop at nothing to devour it. Yeah, no kidding, if you've ever run into any of these in game, oh boy. Number 85B, Relaxosaurus Lux. One day, Relaxosaurus Saurus had an idea. Maybe it was about time for a change. Just then, an electric shock raced through its body. It's not a phase, Mom. I'm just, uh, you know, I was ready for a change. Number 86, Brawn Cherry. Its scent drastically changes before and after pairing. It exudes a pleasing aroma after finding a partner, which is called the fragrance of first love. Number 86B, Brawn Cherry Aqua. Its scent drastically changes before and after pairing. It exudes a pleasing aroma before finding a partner, which is called the perfume of purity. Not sure if we're supposed to be led to believe that Brawn Cherry Aqua become normal Brawn Cherry after mating or something, but that's kind of how I interpreted this. Number 87, Patalia. A pal that transforms into a massive plant when at the end of its life. Once every 10 years, a beautiful flower blooms and a new Patalia is born. Number 88, Reptyro. Magma-like blood runs throughout its body. If a large amount of water is thrown on it, this water rapidly heats, causing an immense vapor explosion. Number 88B, Reptyro Christ. Ice-cold blood runs throughout its body. If heated rapidly, its blood evaporates, causing an immense vapor explosion. Number 89, King Paca. Melpaca serve this pal. Contests between King Paca offer up their vassals as a wager. Those seen alone are losers of such contests. Number 89B, King Paca Christ. With a heart of ice, this pal is terrible at expressing its emotions. A solitary individual is pitiable, seen as too clumsy in the eyes of a Melpaca. Number 90, Mamorous. The vegetation on its back varies between individuals. There is a long history of appreciating this veritable garden of a pal, and there are even Mamorist pruning specialists. Number 90B, Mamoris Christ. The vegetation on its back varies from individual to individual. There was a time when seeds of presumed extinct plants were found still frozen on the back of a Mamoris Christ. Number 91, Wumpo. Researchers once tried to shave off its hair to reveal its true form. In the end, only hair was left as if that was all there was to begin with. Number 91B, Wumpo Botan. Researchers once tried to cut the grass off its body to reveal its true form. In the end, only grass was left, as if that was all there was to begin with. Number 92, Warsect. The ultra-hard armor surrounding its body is extremely strong and heat-resistant. Even a napalm blast would hardly leave a scratch. Number 93, Thangalope. In ages past, its beautiful visage was a common sight in paintings. As time passed, its beautiful pelt and antlers were often seen in works of art. Great double meaning there, making for a simple yet effective and somber entry. Number 94, Felbat. Attacking from the shadows, this pal traps its prey within its cloak-like wings. It's probably best not to know what happens within them, or why the inside of its wings are stained red. Number 95, Keyvern. Sleeping while cuddling a Keyvern is said to be a heavenly experience, but there are some who have been crushed and sent to heaven by ones that toss and turn in their sleep. Number 96, Blazemute. 
Legends say it was born during a volcanic eruption. A strange group even claims that this continent is laid upon the back of a giant Blazemute. This one is interesting to me because if you watched my previous video on Pal World, you'll know that I said there was very little known about one of the groups in the game in particular, that being the Brothers of the Eternal Pyre, who are found in and around Mount Obsidian, which is exactly where the Alpha Blazemute is found. In that video, I also speculate that they might be a religious order of some kind for a couple of reasons, and although Blazemute's entry doesn't explicitly implicate the brothers as being the ones spoken of in the piece, I think there is a non-zero chance that this is what's being implied. Number 97, Hell Zephyr. It calls forth lightning from the depths of hell. One who dies from Hell Zephyr's inferno is sure to be sent to the underworld. Well, okay, that's a little bit dark. How about the next one? Number 98, Astagon. A savage beast born of the abyss. Thou shalt not stand before the beast. Thou shalt not heed the beast. Okay, well, uh, damn, moving on, this one's gotta be better. Number 90, Menacing. Being made of pure energy, its insides are completely hollow. This pal crams still living prey into its hollow body where it absorbs them. Hellish screams of pain can often be heard coming from inside this pal. There's something going on with these three, and I'm not really sure what's being implied. I have an idea that I'm gonna kind of talk about near the end of this list, which we're actually approaching at this point, but either way, I don't know, these three in particular just really rub me the wrong way. Number 100, Anubis. Once seen as a symbol of nobility and an idol for those who once shunned wealth and power, yet over time, this pal became a token of death. Much like the pal's name, this one is just a straight up reintegration of real world folklore, and somehow it just kind of works. Number 101, Njormantide. Legend says that the Njormantide was once a wise man, who, after being wrongly convicted and cast into a whirlpool, returned as this pal to destroy those who wronged him. Followed up by number 101, Njormantide. Tide Ignis. Legend says that Jormantide Ignis was once a warrior, who, after being wrongly convicted and cast into a volcano, returned as this pal to destroy those who wronged him. Number 102, Suzaku. It was once believed to usher in the dry season. Whenever there was a drought the previous year, people would relentlessly seek to cull its numbers, hoping to bring about a plentiful harvest in the next year. Number 102B, Suzaku Aqua. It was once believed to usher in the rainy season. If there was a flood the previous year, people would relentlessly seek to cull its numbers, hoping to avert disaster in the coming year. We're getting toward the end of our list here, so next up are the pals that can be found accompanying bosses, as well as any variants therein. If you want to know more about their lore, then my other Pal World video is definitely the one to check out, but for now, let's take a look at what their entries have to say. Number 103, Grisbolt. With a friendly smile and a hearty physique, it is docile towards one it recognizes as a partner. For reasons unexplained, its personality undergoes a drastic change when wielding a minigun. Number 104, Lyleen. A docile pal full of love. It watches over small pals who have lost their parents. It uses a full power solar blast to discipline naughty pals. Number 104B, Lyleen Noct. An elegant pal full of grace. It admonishes any who are disrespectful with a painful slap. Some pals actively seek out this punishment. Ain't no way, bruh. Ain't no way they made a pal dommy mom. Number 105, Phalaris. When it finds its prey, it unleashes a whirlwind of flames, burning the entire area to ash. Phalaris breath is known for its pleasing scent. Number 106, Orserk. It sends electricity into its foe's wounds, roasting them from the inside out. Fights between Orserk end in the blink of an eye. Number 107, Shadowbeak. Born from the depths of insanity, its very existence should not be. Having lost all genetic ties to other pals, one wonders if it could still even be considered a pal. And now we're onto the final stretch, the last five pals in the entire pal deck, the legendaries. And although I once again already spoke about them somewhat in my previous pal world lore video, I've got something to say about each of these guys. For the first two though, it's necessary to examine them together. Number 108, Palladius. Once one with Necromus, its gleaming form is free of all negative emotions. However, a glimmer of hatred can still be seen deep within its eyes. Number 109, Necromus. Once one with Palladius, its darkened form is the embodiment of negative emotions. However, a glimmer of compassion can still be seen deep within its eyes. So, Palladius and Necromus were once the very same pal, and clearly, after they split for whatever reason, they've since come to embody opposite aspects of light and darkness. I think it's fairly obvious, based on the descriptions of each, that there's a sort of yin and yang dynamic at play here. 
with a small piece of the other's characterization within each one respectively. Of all the legendaries, these two seem to me like they have the most narrative potential. Who was this pal before they split? What caused the split, and what was their significance to the ancient civilization? Hopefully we learn a bit more in future content. 110. Frostalian Guardian deity of Palpagos Island, known as the Winter Caller, in the past when a calamity struck the land, it soared into the sky and sealed away the threat by casting the island into an eternal winter. Frostalian is the first part of a pair, or I guess trio of pals, that concern calamities both former and foretold, as we can see from this entry, for Frostalian seems to have been responsible for ending a calamity that took place sometime in Palpagos's past, but the nature of that calamity is still completely up in the air. However, Matters are confused all the more because of Frostalian's subspecies. 110b Frostalian Noct, guardian deity of Palpagos Island known as the Nightcaller. In the past, when a calamity struck the land, it soared into the sky and sealed away the threat by casting the island into eternal darkness. The one and only legendary subspecies in the entire game, Frostalian Noct's pal deck entry is extra confusing. This is a pal that can only be unlocked via breeding, to my knowledge, and doesn't exist naturally anywhere in the game. A bit like legendary Pokemon, these entries seem to suggest there's only one of each, even though we know that that can't possibly be true. So what's up with this? Are we led to believe that there's a separate calamity at some point in the past? And if so, were Frostalian Noct somehow roaming the land, just the same as any other species? While I was thinking about this, I even briefly entertained the idea that maybe there was some time travel shenanigans afoot, and it kind of saved the world before it was even born, but I think that's probably not the case. It's just one of those odd thoughts that arises from apparent inconsistencies like this one. Either way, we're on to our final pal today, and that is, of course, number 111, Jet Dragon. Watches over Palpagos Islands from high above. When Calamity returns to the land, the earth will split open, and the skies will burn. It is destined to strike down the Calamity in a flash of total destruction. This coincides with what we've already seen from Frostalian. While that pal prevented a catastrophic event in the past, Jet Dragon is foretold to do so in days yet to come. It's tough to know what form such a calamity may take. Perhaps Astagon and its weirdly biblical flavor text may have something to do with it? Then again, maybe not. Perhaps the aforetold calamity may even serve as the inciting force behind the creation of a new island map, as told of in Pal World's development roadmap. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But either way, this is where the Pal deck, at least as of early access, update 1.4.1, comes to an end. Or is it? Let's just leave that for next time, shall we? Hey, thanks for watching today, and for making it to the end of yet another video. I hope you had some fun and learned something new about the many creatures of Pal World in our exploration today, and I'm glad you've enjoyed enough to stick around all the way to the end. That means a lot. This video was something I knew I wanted to make since early on into my time with Pal World, but I thought it was also something I should put together sooner rather than later, since I plan to reference some of this stuff in future uploads, in what's rapidly becoming a Pal World series on my channel. As I said near the beginning, I also haven't done one of these kind of list for formatted videos in quite some time, and truth be told, I like doing them a lot. Not only because it gives me a chance to retread some ground and make sure that everybody is on the same page before I produce content of a more theoretical or out-there nature, but also because, truth be told, it's not as difficult to make nor as research-heavy as some of my other videos. Every once in a while, I'm okay with putting one of these out just to give myself a little bit of a break, but nevertheless, I wouldn't do so unless I thought it was legitimately valuable for you guys watching. So if you made it this far, hopefully that means I did my job. Job. If you enjoyed today, then I hope you'll decide to subscribe if you haven't done so already and stick around for future content. As I already said, I've got a lot more Pal World stuff in the works right now, but it's certainly not the only game that I like to explore on the channel, so give some of that a watch too if you're interested. Anyway, I know this was a rather long video, so I'm not going to bore you too much here at the end. That's going to do it from me. This is Averberon. I'll see you again soon, and have a good one.